August 1942, German forces pushed deep into the Soviet Union, seeking to pierce its political heart before the brutal winter sets in. However, just north of Stalingrad, the Soviets fight four brutal battles to slow the advance of the German Wehrmacht. Collectively known as the Kotluban operations, these pitched battles are some of the fiercest of World War II, and the Soviets take 200,000 casualties, a staggering figure. The German assault, however, is sufficiently slowed and allows the Red Army to prepare the ideologically important city of Stalingrad for defense. In preparation for the coming siege, the Soviet high command ships hundreds of tons of cattle and grain across the Volga River. However, Stalin refuses to evacuate a single person of the 400,000 civilians left in the city. This cold calculus has one single purpose. With civilians still in the city, Stalin believes it will inspire the Red Army to fight all the harder in defense of the city. Plus, many of these civilians can be rounded up and forced to fight as partisans if required. It's a brutal move, made even more punishing by the fact that Stalin's harvest victory, as his shipping of food out of the city is known, leaves Stalingrad short of food for its nearly half a million population. As the German forces move closer, the civilian population is pressed into service to build trenches and other defensive fortifications. Nobody's under any illusion that the siege that's coming will be an easy one and the entire city is preparing for some of the bloodiest fighting of the Second World War. The Germans punctuate the point by softening up the city with a massive aerial bombardment starting on August 23rd and continuing until the end of the month. The German bombing turns the city into a massive funeral pyre and thousands die or are severely wounded. After the 25th of August, the Soviets simply stop collecting data on casualties as there are so many. The Soviet Air Force rises to meet the German bombers, but fighter escorts tear into them. German pilots are better trained and more experienced after the failed Battle of Britain, and the Soviet Air Force suffers 201 aircraft losses by the end of the month. By August 31st, the Soviet Air Force has only 192 aircraft left, 57 of which are fighters. The Luftwaffe completely owns the skies over Stalingrad. The German 6th Army is the first to feel the teeth of Soviet defenses. Short on tanks and anti-tank guns, the Soviets are instead pressing anti-aircraft guns into service to fend off the German tanks. The 1077th Anti-Aircraft Regiment is staffed mostly of young female volunteers who have little if any training in engaging ground targets. The women show incredible bravery despite their lack of experience, and the Germans are forced to destroy or overrun every single one of the 37 anti-aircraft guns, after which they find to their surprise that they are all manned by women. Enemy infantry is being met by workers' militias organized by the NKVD. These civilian units have no training and are often sent to battle with no weapons. They are cannon fodder in every sense of the word. The Russian callous disregard for human life is apparent as hundreds of unarmed civilians are mowed down by German defenders. Any who try to retreat or run away are shot in the back by their NKVD commanders. The militias are slaughtered in scores but succeed in eating up German ammunition in time, slowing the advance and softening them up for Red Army units. Inside of the city itself, factories churn out tanks even throughout the fighting. There's no time to paint or even equip these tanks with gun sights, and they're literally driven by their crews from the factory floor straight to the front line. Without even primitive gun sights, these tanks are forced to fight at practically point-blank range. As August comes to a close, Army Group South B reaches the Volga north of Stalingrad. The Soviets are pinched off as German units also advance south of the city along the river, forcing them to abandon defensive positions outside of the city for the inner defensive ring inside of it. By the end of the month, the Germans have completely enveloped Stalingrad on three sides. September 1942 Bridges across the Volga have been destroyed by the German Luftwaffe, and with the Germans closing access to the city off from north, south, and east, the only way to resupply Soviet forces is by crossing the river in boats and barges pulled by tugs. However, this is incredibly dangerous, as German artillery is well within range of the river, and German air patrols descend on any attempt to cross the river. Many Soviet civilians and soldiers both die attempting to cross the river, and yet the efforts continue mostly at night, as the defenders inside are desperately needing weapons, ammunition, and food. On September 5th, the Soviets attempt to counterattack and help lift the siege on the city. The Soviet 24th and 66th Armies rally for an attack against the 14 Panzer Corps. However, the Germans have air superiority and advance warning of the attack, and the Luftwaffe decimates the Soviets' artillery. Without their artillery support, the Soviets are forced to withdraw after only a few hours of fighting. They lose one quarter of their 120 tanks in the fighting, with minimal losses on the German side. Stalin's Order No. 227 has made it punishable by military tribunal to retreat from the enemy. Thus, Soviet commanders refuse to order retreats even in the face of certain defeat. 
This has turned Stalingrad into an absolute meat grinder of inhuman proportions, as badly outgunned and outnumbered Soviet units are destroyed to the man. However, a refusal to retreat has also severely slowed the German advance, and by the time fighting reaches into the city in mid-September, the Germans are now fighting block to block. On the 14th of September, the Germans launch a three-prong attack into the city, hoping to overwhelm the defenders with a speedy maneuver. The 51st Army Corps 295th Infantry Division advances on the strategically important Mameyev Kurgan Hill, high ground which gives whoever holds it command over large parts of the city. The 71st Infantry Division attacks on the Central Rail Station and the main landing stage on the Volga River, where the Soviets are receiving a steady trickle of supplies and reinforcements from across the river. The 48th Panzer Corps is sent to attack south of the Tsaritsa River to help pin down the Soviet defenders. The attacks initially go to plan, with the Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division suffering very high losses in a counterattack in the Mameyev Kurgan and Rail Station No. 1. In just one day, it loses 30% of its soldiers in fierce fighting. Only 320 of the original 10,000 men who make up the 13th Guards Rifle Division will survive the battle. They succeed, however, in retaking both objectives at least temporarily, with both objectives changing hands multiple times. The railway station changes hands an incredible 14 times in just 6 hours. The fight is so brutal that by the evening of the second day of fighting, the 13th Guards Rifle Division now exists only on paper. In the south of the city, 50 Soviet soldiers make a last stand at a huge grain elevator. They're surrounded and cut off from all resupply, but continue to fight for 5 days. They fight off 10 assaults by German forces before running out of ammunition and water. To deny the enemy valuable grain, they set fire to it before retreating. As the Germans sift through the wreckage of the fighting, they're shocked to discover only 40 enemies dead. They believed that due to the intensity of the resistance, they were up against a much larger unit. Elsewhere in the city, Soviet Sergeant Yakov Pavlov commands his unit to fortify the ruins of a four-story building with a commanding view. The building is strategically important, and the Germans attempt to take it with assault after assault. However, the Soviets have surrounded the fortified building with minefields and are defending it with well-entrenched machine gun nests. Incredibly, Pavlov will hold the building for two months with few reinforcements and earn the Hero of the Soviet Union Award for his efforts. The fighting rages through the month of September, with the Germans making slow incremental progress. However, by the end of the month, they've failed to secure the all-important Volga River crossings. Without achieving these objectives, the Soviets are able to continue pouring reinforcements and resupply to the beleaguered defenders, even under assault from German artillery and aircraft both. October 1942 With the Luftwaffe unable to stop the Soviet reinforcements over the Volga, and with German ground forces stuck in bitter house-to-house -house fighting, the battle for the city has turned into a fight for meters. Success is measured in number of buildings taken or defended, and the fighting has devolved into a brutal close-quarters combat. The Soviets are creating defensive positions in apartment blocks, houses, factories, and warehouses, defending them with small groups of 5 to 10 men. This allows them to spread out across the city, with other defenders immediately searching to retake a lost position. It's an insane game of whack-a-mole, and the Germans call it Rattenkrieg or Rat War. In the taller buildings, German and Soviet soldiers fight each other off on different floors, firing up or down at one another through holes in the floors and ceilings. Soviet defenders fight suicidally, as once they're pushed to the topmost floor, there's nowhere left to retreat. They're fighting on what Sun Tzu once called death ground, a position where only options are victory or death, and thus are fighting fiercely for every single floor. Superior German firepower is useless in these close quarters battles, and Soviet commanders are taking full advantage of the urban terrain. They order units to hug German forces so as to deny them the use of artillery or close air support. The Germans are still better equipped, and the tactic costs the Soviets dearly but it is staggeringly effective. With the Russians having little regard for the lives of the men they sent into the fighting, they're stopping the German offensive with a literal tsunami of human bodies. On October 14th, the Germans launched the greatest offensive of the Stalingrad campaign. Within eyesight of the Red October Steel Factory, the Barricadi Arms Factory, and the Stalingrad Tractor Factory, all of which are running around the clock despite air and artillery attack, the Germans launch an attack using the 15th Panzer 24th Panzer Division and 305th Infantry Divisions. By the afternoon, the Germans have inflicted heavy casualties on the 37th Guards Rifle Division and pushed past the tractor factory to arrive at the Volga. The Soviets immediately respond by sending three battalions from the 300th Rifle Division and the 45th Rifle Division to lift the siege on the Red October Steel Factory. The Germans will hold two of their objectives, but ultimately fail to expel the Soviets fully from the Barakanti Arms Factory. 
November 1942. The Germans control 90% of the city and have reached the Volga. However, by now ice flows make resupply across the river impossible, though the advance has split Soviet forces in two completely surrounded pockets. However, the Germans have focused so completely on taking Stalingrad that they have neglected to secure their flanks outside the city. These flanks are being defended by Hungarian, Italian, and other client state forces who are nowhere near as well equipped or trained as the Germans. They are also severely lacking anti-tank weapons. The Germans have failed to secure the natural line of defense, the Don River, outside the city, and what defenders are there are spread dangerously thin across a wide front. This is not lost on Soviet high command, and on November 19th they launch Operation Uranus, a massive attack on the northern flank launched with three complete armies consisting of the 1st Guards Army, 5th Tank Army, and 21st Army consisting of a total of 18 infantry divisions, 8 tank brigades, 2 motorized brigades, 6 cavalry divisions, and 1 anti-tank brigade. The Romanians have been capturing radio intercepts of the pending attack for days, but the request for reinforcements go completely ignored. In short order, the Romanian 3rd Army is completely overrun, and Soviet forces penetrate deep into the German rear areas. Incredibly, the Germans have taken no steps to secure their rear, and the Soviets are able to push far south. Bad weather grounds the Luftwaffe, which is unable to conduct air operations to help repel the assault. On the 20th of November, Soviet forces launch a second offensive south of Stalingrad against the Romanian 4th Army Corps. These Romanian forces are largely made up of infantry and lack anti-tank weapons, thus they are easily routed by Soviet tank forces. Three days later, on November 23rd, Soviet forces from the northern and southern attacks meet at the town of Kalak, effectively trapping the German 6th Army and supporting forces inside Stalingrad. In total, 265,000 enemy forces have been trapped inside Stalingrad, the city they had fought so hard to take. Like a mouse straining for cheese on a trap, the Germans are now stuck. On November 24th, Field Marshal Erich von Manstein implores Hitler not to order the 6th Army to break out of its encirclement and abandon Stalingrad. Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, also assures Hitler that he'll be able to keep the 6th Army resupplied via airdrops. The two convince Hitler and seal the fate of the 6th Army. December 1942 Incredibly, Hitler orders that Army Group A continue its progress invading the caucus south of Stalingrad, rather than redirect to help lift the envelopment of the 6th Army. Hitler still believes that another relief force can be assembled and that the Luftwaffe can keep the 6th Army resupplied. However, the trapped Germans require 700 tons of supplies a day, and the Luftwaffe is hard-pressed to deliver an average of 106 tons a day. It soon becomes clear to Monstein that this is a completely untenable situation and he implores Hitler to enact a plan for the 6th Army to break out, reversing his earlier position. The Soviets, meanwhile, launch attacks on the airfields being used to land supplies. On December 23rd, the Soviet 24th Tank Corps push into Skasirskaya, deep behind German lines, in order to neutralize nearby airfields. On the morning of the 24th, Soviet tanks reach Tatsinskaya and destroy many German planes there. Now the Germans are forced to move their resupply efforts to an airfield 190 miles from Stalingrad, adding even more time and difficulties to the air resupply operations. Nonetheless, the resupply attempts continue and soon begin to dwindle due to ongoing losses of aircraft and crew. Soviet anti-air guns and fighters alike take a heavy toll on German aircraft trying to land supplies to the beleaguered 6th Army. 165 transport aircraft are destroyed and 328 heavily damaged beyond repair. 266 Junkers Ju-52s are destroyed along with 42 Ju-86s, 9 FW-200 Condors, 5 HE-177 Bombers, and 1 Ju-290. 1,000 pilots and aircrew are lost in the attempts to keep the 6th Army inside Stalingrad resupplied. On the ground, the German Army launches Operation Winter Storm, an offensive to try and break through to the 6th Army. Hitler is signed off on the attack but insisted that the 6th Army try not to reach the advancing German forces by launching its own breakout attack in their direction. Instead, he insists that the 6th Army remain in place, believing them to be a critical cornerstone on the River Volga. By the 19th of December, German forces are within 30 miles of the 6th Army, and some officers insist that Hitler's orders be defied and the 6th Army break out from its position to link up with German forces. Those requests go ignored, however. The Soviets, however, launched their own attack on the 16th of December aimed at punching through the mostly Italian contingent of the Axis Army on the Don. The Italians fight surprisingly well, a rarity in this war, 
but ultimately three days later they can no longer hold off the advancing Soviets. With the entire relief effort collapsing, Manstein pleads with Hitler to order the 6th Army to break out, but Hitler refuses. It's just as well, as by now the 6th Army doesn't have the fuel necessary to attempt a breakout, and doing so on foot in winter conditions would have likely end it in disaster. German forces now shift from attempting to link up with the Stalingrad pocket to defending against brutal Soviet counterattacks. January 1943 on the 7th of January, the Red Army High Command sends three envoys into the city with terms of surrender. The Soviets deliver terms to German Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus. The terms are very generous. If he agrees to surrender within 24 hours, all prisoners would be guaranteed safe, humane treatment with medical care given to all injured or sick. Prisoners would also be given proper food rations and allowed to keep personal belongings. Further, after the war, they'd be allowed to repatriate to any country of their choice. Paulus contacts Hitler and asks for permission to surrender. Hitler, however, flat out rejects it. The 6th Army may no longer be an effective fighting force, its men starving with barely any ammunition left, but they are tying up a significant number of Russian forces. The Germans retreat into the Stalingrad suburbs, losing the vital airfields at Potomnik and Gumrak. This means resupply and air evacuation of the wounded is only possible at the Stalingradskaya Flight School, but landings end there on the 23rd of January. Only intermittent airdrops of supplies will continue from this moment on. The 6th Army has been all but completely abandoned. Bloody urban combat ensues, with the Soviets steadily pushing the Germans back toward the Volga River. The Germans refuse to surrender, believing the Soviets will simply kill any prisoners taken. Some Soviet citizens, unhappy with Stalin's regime, have joined the Germans and they fight like caged animals, knowing that they will for sure be killed if captured. On the 22nd of January, Paulus is once again given terms of surrender. He contacts Hitler and informs him that he can no longer command his men as they have no more ammunition or food. Hitler, however, once more denies him the opportunity to surrender and instead orders that he and his men stand fast to the last soldier and the last bullet. He promises Paulus that he and his men have made a historic contribution to one of the greatest struggles in German history and will be remembered as heroes. On January 26th, German forces have been completely split by a Soviet thrust into two pockets. The northern pocket consists of the 8th Corps and the 11th Corps, and they're cut off from communication with Paulus by Soviet forces. Two days later, the defensive pockets are once more split, this time into three parts, with the northern pocket containing the 11th Corps the Central Pocket, the 8th and the 51st Corps, and the Southern Pocket, the 14th Panzer Corps and the 4th Corps. The Germans now have 40,000 to 50,000 sick and wounded. On January 30th, in response to Paulus's notification that the entire army will likely collapse by the end of the day, Hitler issues field promotions to several officers in the 6th Army. He promotes Paulus to General Field Marshal and reminds Paulus that no German or Prussian Field Marshal has ever surrendered in combat. This comes with the implication that if Paulus surrenders, he will be shaming himself for eternity. The next day, the southern pocket collapses, and Soviet forces take German headquarters, capturing Paulus who claims that he was taken by surprise. He refuses to issue an order for the northern pocket to surrender. The central pocket surrenders a few hours later. February 1943 On February 2nd, the northern pocket officially surrenders to the Soviets. An estimated 91,000 German prisoners of war are captured, many of them wounded, sick, or starving. Few of them will survive brutal Soviet POW camps and make it back home to Germany after the war. Now go watch Battle of the Bulge or click this other video instead.